So if you're here today and you're not familiar with the Bible and you don't really call yourself a Christian, we're here to share with you some information that will enable you to make an informed decision. So we ask you to simply remain open. Mark Twain even said, we're all ignorant and just about different things. We went to a prayer meeting, like my wife said, came home, nothing unusual about the night. I've never studied the topic of hell, had no interest in it. We don't watch dark movies, nothing to do with that. I've never had a vision before. And I got up at three o'clock in the morning to get a glass of water. And suddenly I was pulled out of my body, like being sucked out of your body. And I found myself falling through the air down this long tunnel and it was getting hotter and hotter. And I entered into this open cavern area, and then I landed on the stone floor in hell. I looked up and I saw these bars and these rough hewn stone walls. I was actually in a prison cell, filthy, stinking, dirty prison cell, uh, like a dungeon. And um, I couldn't believe I was there. How did I get here? Why am I here? I was fully awake and cognizant. I was not dreaming. Isaiah 24, 22 says, and they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison. Proverbs 7, 27 mentions going down to hell to the chambers uh, of death. You have, it's just a useless wasting away. You have no purpose, no destiny of any kind. Ecclesiastes 9, 10 says, there is no work, no device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in Sheol. It doesn't matter if you're somebody famous here, no one would know who you are there. Ecclesiastes 6, 4 says, your name is covered in darkness. You have no identity, no one would know who you are and you're forgotten in hell. Psalms 88, 12, Isaiah 26, 14. <clears throat> the smells in hell are so foul and putrid and disgusting, worse than any open sewer you can possibly ever imagine. And, but add to, to it sulfur. sulfur. It's not like here where you take a nice deep breath, you don't get to do that in hell. You have to fight and gasp for even the tiniest bit of air. And I'll demonstrate to you, this is how you have to breathe in hell for all eternity. It's like, My eyes are rest, but there is no form of rest ever. So for all eternity, you have to endure that. Just like here, if you were up two nights, you're pretty much a wreck after two nights. Well, that's how you're going to be forever and ever, but it just keeps getting worse. <clears throat> and Revelation 14, 11 says, the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest. Now, no, no rest night. from the torments, but no rest of any kind. Because Isaiah 57, 20 said, the wicked are like the troubled sea that He's cannot always rest. Moving. You know, see, but again, that's a blessing from God to rest because Psalms 127.2 said, it's the Lord that gives his beloved sleep. You're not his beloved there. I was standing next to this pit of fire and seeing people actually burn and demons tormenting people. It was the most awful sight to see people on fire again and, and burning and, and helplessly lost with these demons tormenting them. It's beneath a cavern tunnel. And all around the walls of the cavern walls were demonic creatures of all different sizes and shapes, twisted, deformed, grotesque, horrible looking creatures. No symmetry no, to their bodies. Where their all worm dies not, and the fire is not quenched. And he personalized it with the, there, and he used the word maggot. So you actually have maggots on you. Isaiah 14, 11 says, where the maggot will be spread under thee and will cover thee. It's the word maggot in the original. I mean, this Whereas is where a worm dies not because the flesh is never fully consumed. So as Job 24, 20 says, the maggot will feed sweetly Why would God make me? such a horrible place? Matthew 25, 41, Jesus said that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. He never intended for man to go there. So if one. you're a person that says, I don't, I don't want God in my life. Well, there is a place prepared that has nothing to do with God. Can you see why hell's so horrible? Absolute darkness. And then suddenly, this bright light appeared. I knew immediately who it was. And I said, Jesus. Jesus. His feet. That I realized that because he went to the cross, I didn't have to go to this place. I was so grateful for the cross. I was so thankful for, for what he did for us. Why did you send me to this horrible place? He said, because many people do not believe hell is real. He said, even some of my own people do not and believe hell exists. So and he said, because you're made in my image and they hate me. Remember John 15, 18, Jesus said, they hated me before they hated you. These demons hate you. And I thought, Lord, I don't want to tell anybody about this experience. They're going to think I'm crazy or had a bad dream. 
He said, it's not your job to convict their hearts. That's the yeah. Holy Spirit. But as an unsaved person, he wanted me to experience what they feel there. Hopelessness. And none of us in life here have any idea what that's like to be hopeless. I mean, your situation might be awful, but you can always die to get out of it. In hell, you can't. Your soul lives on for eternity because we're made in God's image. You can't ever get out of it, and that by far was the worst part. Understanding that 10 million years will go by, it doesn't matter. I'm still there. There's no angels to come rescue me. There's no friend. There's nobody going to come get you out. There is no help you're going to ever get. Isaiah 38, 18 says, Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for thy and truth. And we know Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way. There is no other way. But for those people there, it's too late. The decision's final. We went above the earth's surface, and um, we came out of this whirlwind tunnel, Isaiah 40, 24, and so forth. But he had me see people falling back down this tunnel we just came out after of. Another, falling back down this tunnel. Another. And God allowed me to feel a piece of his heart. And he wept when he saw people falling into hell. And I said, Lord, I can't even stand to feel a piece of the anguish you feel of your creation going into hell. I can't stand it. Stop. And, you know, his love passes knowledge. Ephesians 3.19 says he loves us far more than we can even conceive. He doesn't want to see one person go to this place. That's why he wants us as Christians to go witness. Open our mouth. We have the words of life Being good. to share with people. Because, see, your standard of good and God's are two different things. Heaven and God are perfect. And James 2.10 says, if we offend the law in one point, we're guilty of all. If we lie once, Revelation 21.8 says, all liars shall depart in the lake of fire. I said, well, say you um, went and found the most expensive home in the country, and you knocked on their door, and you said, uh, excuse me, I'm moving in with you because I'm a good person. What do you think the people would say? No, right? And you wouldn't expect them to. You have no relationship with them. I said, but you, you go through your whole life. You have nothing to do with God. You deny Jesus as a son of God, which he said is the only way to his house. Then at the end of your life, you have the nerve to come knock on his door and demand to live That's in his I house. Think. What are you going to tell me, Bill? You're going to say, Bill, you're not going to get to my house. I'm trying to give you clear directions. The same way God gives us clear directions to his house. I think God knows where he lives. Amen? All we have to do is follow his directions. That's not being narrow-minded. He's being specific, you specific directions He's how to get to his house. He's not trying to keep you out. You know, it's not God up there saying, oh, I think this one goes to heaven, this one goes to hell. It's not that way. All of us above the age of accountability are automatically on that road to hell. John 3, 17 and 18 explain that. We're condemned already because of sin. So he's not sending you. You're already going there. That's why he came, was to get you off that road. All you have to do is look to the cross. Go free. Right? He has to punish the criminal. Uh, well, the same way, God has to punish the sin. But he took out that punishment on Jesus. But if you don't want to take it, and you deny Jesus, then the you fire take to retrieve something. And the fire burned me. I wouldn't say, why'd that fire burn me? That was mean of that fire. I didn't do anything to that fire. I wouldn't say that, would I? Why? Because the nature of the fire is to burn. Well, God's nature is to consume sin. So see... A holy God and sinful man are not compatible, just like your hand and the fire are not compatible. If we show up in God's presence the way we are, we would be consumed because of his very nature. So how can man ever show up in God's presence? Only one way. We would have to appear to be sinless. Well, how can that happen? Only one way. If someone came and lived a perfect life and never sinned once, that someone is Jesus Christ. And he stands there before the Father and he says, I've never sinned. I'm going to exchange my righteousness, my right standing for their sin. I'm going to take their sin on my body. If they would trust in me and not their works, Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So if we trust in what Jesus did and not our own works, then he considers our trust as righteousness. And he gives us his righteousness, takes our sin, washes it away with his blood. Now we can stand there and appear to be sinless because our sins are dealt with. Isn't that an awesome plan that God came up with? <laughs> Praise God. But you might say, I don't like this one-way business you Christians have. You ought to be grateful there is a way. That God made a way. He made a way where there was no he way. He loves you, and he doesn't want you to go there. Your soul is eternal, and it's so precious to God. It's so valuable. So this is the clear directions to heaven I want to give you. John 3.36 says, if He that has the Son has everlasting life, 
but he that has not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. You have to know the Son. How do you do that? Just two verses. Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, unless a man repent, you shall all likewise perish. We have to repent. And all repent means is to be humble enough to admit, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. I want to turn away from my sin. I want to follow Jesus. Now, on your own, you can't walk away from sin. But with the Holy Spirit and God's grace, He empowers you to be able to walk away from sin. You just have to be willing right now to say, I want to turn away from my sin and repent. I'm sorry for my sins. That's repentance. And Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised Him from the dead, we shall be saved. You have to believe it in your own heart and confess it with your own mouth. That's the clear directions to heaven. There is no other way. As Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. If you want to live at his house, you do it his way. So my last scripture for you tonight is, or today, Revelation 20, 15 says, Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. He has a book. And wouldn't it be awful to stand there before him and him say to you, your name's not in this book. Depart from me into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. That's what he would have to say. He doesn't want to say that. But you have to make the decision here, right now, why you have the opportunity. Because I'm telling you, one second after you die, it's too late. There is no appeals court. There's no friend that can save you. There's no angels to protect you. You die alone. And it's going to be too late then. And if you leave here today and you say, I'll think about it tomorrow, your heart grows harder. And it's harder to reach you. So there's more chance of you not getting saved. And you don't know that you'll have tomorrow. So my question for you tonight is, do you know if your name is written in his book? You have to know this. You have to be positive of this one. If you have any doubt whatsoever, you need to know today. And you can know that right now. With every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're here today and you would say, Bill, I don't know if my name's in his book. I'm not certain. And I don't know if I've ever really repented. You can be certain right today, and you need to be. If you, if you have any doubt at all in your mind, any doubt, I'm going to ask you at the count of three to raise your hand. Anybody here that wants to know Jesus, and you don't know if your name's in his book, then raise your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hand. All over, I see hands. Raise your hand, raise your hands. Raise them up high. Don't be embarrassed. He hung naked on a cross for us. You want to be certain of this one, that he writes your name in his book. If everybody would stand. I'm going to challenge any one of you, raise your Please hand. Please don't leave here. Please don't leave here. Make your way down to the front for Jesus. Show him you mean business. You're making a commitment today. This is the most important decision Man, you could ever make. God's got this big book. And your name will be in there. This one Christ soul is Lord. so precious to God. All of heaven celebrates over your one soul. So please come down here. Jesus.